Okay, today we're going to be talking about the Antichrist. So before we do, let's let's pray, eh? Father, I ask and pray that you help me deliver this word today. Father, help me to get across your heart and your will. Father, I pray that we would open up our hearts to your word. And Father, if we're challenged, let it be so. Father, I just ask that we would all be open, ready to hear and receive. Holy Spirit, your will be done in our hearts. Father, we just want to be followers of the true Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is truth. And Father, we thank you and ask that you would open our eyes and our ears to that truth. In Yeshua's name. Amen. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about the Antichrist. The word Antichrist is found four times in the New Testament. Three times in the book of 1 John and one time in the book of 2 John. So often these books are referred to little Johns because they're little. They're little letters, not the main book of John. So they, in these two books are the four occurrences of the word Antichrist. So we will look at these verses later. I will endeavour to explain what this word is and its uses in the scriptures. There are a lot of speculation around the world. There's a, sorry, there's a lot of speculation around this word Antichrist. First of all, I would like to spend a little time on how this word had been used throughout the last 2,000 years. As before this, it wasn't used. Like stated earlier, it is found four times in letters that are attributed to John, written in the late 1st century, around 90 AD. So these letters that we referred to earlier were written around 90 AD. That's the common thought. An important fact. These letters were written to believers, not non-believers. And you'll find this if you go to those letters in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, you'll find at the start of those books that it's written to this, to that, to the beloved, to, to different people. So they're written to believers and not non-believers. This is a really important thing to understand, that this wasn't written to everybody. This was written specifically to believers. In the last 2,000 years, there have been many accusations of different people and organisations who have been accused of being the Antichrist. The views on who or what is the Antichrist has chopped and changed throughout the last 2,000 years, ranging from individuals to religious organisations to political parties and in the modern world certain corporate bodies or certain corporations. So let's go through some examples on how this word has been used throughout time. The only one of the late first, early, second century apostolic fathers to use the term Antichrist is Polycarp. Now if you remember from a teaching we did a while ago, Polycarp was closely connected to John. And in the term, when he uses it, he's warning the Philippians that everyone who preached false doctrine was an Antichrist. So he had of all these People, he's the only one that actually used this term. John Chris, Chrysostom. John Chrysostom. 347 to 407 AD, he warned against speculating about the Antichrist, saying, 
this is, I quote, let us not therefore inquire into these things. He preached that by knowing Paul's description of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians, Christians would avoid deception. So this is what he said. Remember, we're going through history on how different people view the, this, this terminology. Beginning in the 16th century, the fixation of Antichrist as a coming or present terrible individual gave way to the view of Antichrist as a collective body of evil. This position has been accepted in the abstract by some medieval theologians, but it was made concrete and popular by Martin Luther, who insisted that the institution of the papacy, or papacy, rather than any given pope, was Antichrist. That was from the Britannica Encyclopedia. So rather than expecting a single Antichrist to rule the earth during a future tribulation period, Martin Luther, John Calvin and other Protestant reformers saw the Antichrist as a present feature in the world of their time, fulfilled in the papacy. So they actually viewed these, these great men of God that we, that, that, that a lot of denominations rely on, they viewed that the Antichrist was actually in their time frame, not in some future tribulation period. Doctrinal works of literature published by the Lutherans, the Reformed churches, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Anabaptists and the Methodists contain references to the Pope as the Antichrist. So this is in their, their literature. But this all comes from Martin Luther and his view and his opinion, which was against the Catholic Church of the day. So then this doctrine is fed down through these different denominations and has become part of their doctrine. And this is why a certain mindset of the Antichrist is among the churches, because of one man's opinion or a couple of men of men's opinion. A common theme that runs throughout history, especially when it comes to religion and politics, was to accuse your opponent as the Antichrist because they differed from your beliefs. Gee, that doesn't happen today, does it? <laughs> Never. And that was a common theme. If you had a different view or a different belief in the world of religion or politics, you are automatically referred to as an antichrist. This is this is how men operate. This is how we get to our ideas and thoughts today. We do the same thing. Protestants against the Pope and against the Roman Catholic Church. This is an example. So the Protestants would just label the, the Pope and the Catholic Church as the antichrist because they're the opposite side. The Russian Tsar, Peter the Great, who reigned from 1689 to 1725 AD, was named the Antichrist by his opponents, who were the old believers of the Russian Orthodox Church. Why? Because the Tsar persecuted them. So he, so they accused him of being the Antichrist because he was opposite or opposing them. Leaders of countries or dictators were often referred to as the Antichrist. For example, there was a chap by the name of Frederick II who was anti-papal. So he was labelled the Antichrist because he was against the Roman Catholic Church. Pope John the Twenty Second, who persecuted defectors. He was thought of Antichrist. Anyone that wanted to defect from the Catholic Church under his rule and reign, were persecuted, so he was regarded as the Antichrist. Mussolini, the Italian dictator of the 20th century who tried to revive the Roman Empire, was labelled the Antichrist. So here I'm just going to go through a, some names of who were called the Antichrist throughout history. Remember, we're talking about the last 2,000 years. And here are some names of people that have been labelled the Antichrist. Emperor Nero, 
Emperor Constantine, Muhammad, Saladin, Pope Leo X, Napoleon Bonaparte, Adolf Hitler, John F. Kennedy, Henry Kissinger, Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, why did Mikhail Gorbachev get called the Antichrist? Because he had a birthmark on his head. This is how ridiculous these things get. get. Oh, because that's connected to the mark of the beast. He's got a mark on his head, so he's the Antichrist. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Uh, Pope John Paul II. Ronald Wilson Reagan. Why was he referred to the Antichrist? Because his three names have six letters each, which equals 666. So he was labelled the Antichrist, because there it is, 666. He's got six letters in each of his names. I mean, this is just ridiculous. The list goes on and on and on. This is throughout history. Just leading off, this is just a little bunny trail. Emperor Nero, this is interesting, because he was the head of the Roman Roman Empire, if you take his name and transliterate it into Hebrew, because in Hebrew each letter has a number, if you transliterate his full name into Hebrew, it does come to the numerology 666. So that's interesting. And it's to do with the Roman Empire. I'm, not, I'm just bringing that out because that's why they thought he was Antichrist, because of that name into the Hebrew language. So let's move on to some people today and some modern views today. Here are some people that today in our modern world that are still living who have also been accused of being the Antichrist. Barack Obama, Bill Gates the third, who we all know as Bill Gates, the uh, guy that runs Microsoft. Prince Charles. Prince Charles also has been referred to as the Antichrist because, again, some believe his name adds up to the 666. Prince William has been labelled as the Antichrist. Donald Trump, Joe Biden, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party and the Greens Party. They've all been labelled as the Antichrist. Islam and other world religions. And also the medical systems of our day and age, and, of course, the Internet. So we have gone through a lot of different names, through a lot of different periods of time, and also in modern times, of who people think is and is not the Antichrist. Here's another thought in modern times. This is another thought. The view of Antichrist as a diabolical institution is also reflected to some extent in the view that credit cards and electronic barcodes mark people with Antichrist sign, the number 666. This has been around for the last 30 or 40 years that this is all connected to barcodes and credit cards and all this stuff. This is just a view on bringing out modern views of what the Antichrist is. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just showing you examples of modern views of what the Antichrist is. Here's another view. Again, it's just a view. The Eastern Orthodox, which is Russian. In a, in, in a Christmas 2018 interview on Russian state television, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow warned that, and quote, the Antichrist is the person that will be at the head of the World Wide Web controlling all of humanity. That means that the structure itself poses a danger. There shouldn't be a single centre, at least not in the foreseeable future, if we don't want to bring on the apocalypse. He exhorted listeners not to fall into slavery to what's in your hands. You should remain free inside and not fall under any addiction, not to help alcohol, not to narcotics and not to gadgets. Again, this is just a, someone's opinion, someone's view of what they think that the Antichrist is. I find it interesting that uh, he says that we don't want to bring on the apocalypse. The apocalypse is coming. 
whether we, we can't stop it. It will come when it comes. It will come in the time and the will of Yahweh. No, no man on earth can stop the apocalypse coming. It's his will because it is written that these things will take place. So all of this is to give you an overall view of the thoughts on the Antichrist throughout history continuing to this very day. We see varieties of rulers, people, business, religions, politics have all been proclaimed as the Antichrist. There is nothing new under the sun. There has been and continues to be much speculation of who or what this Antichrist is. They can't all be right. All the examples, all the people, all the accusations, they've all claimed that this is the Antichrist. And obviously, they can't all be right. It's all speculation. Speculation runs rampant among the believers today. Now let's move you to the word of Yah. 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 4. And it says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long, long suffering and teaching. For the time will come, future tense, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will run, the, and sorry, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be a turned aside to fables. Speculation is rampant because people heap up for themselves teachers. Exactly what Paul's warning Timothy not to do. Spec this is why speculation is rampant, because everyone's got an, a, 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 an opinion. Everyone's got a point of view. Speculation is rampant because people heap up for themselves teachers. And the problem is, when you do that, many contradict one another. Oh, the, the, the Pope's the Antichrist. Oh, no, it's the Protestants. It's the Democrats. It's the Republicans. You know, they totally contradict one another. It's, there's confusion. This is called being blown around by every wind of doctrine. Now let's see what the scriptures say and what some words mean. I think this is a good place to lay a foundation in our understanding of the Antichrist. If we are trying to understand Antichrist, we should first seek to understand what Christ means. I think that's a good idea and a good place to start to actually understand what Christ means biblically, not from men's doctrine's point of view. So with that said, because Christ and Antichrist are New Testament words, we're going to look at the Greek first and then we're going to break it back to the Hebrew. The Greek word creo means to anoint, to smear, to consecrate to an office. In different Greek writings, this terminology is used. It's not just the biblical terminology. It's, it's, it's in the Greek writings as well. And in their writings, this word creo means to anoint, for example, the body with oils and fats, to smear or anoint. Weapons were rubbed or anointed with grease or oil. I mean, this is common everyday stuff in that ancient culture. They, they, they anoint them to themselves for all variety of reasons. They anointed or smeared their weapons for war. Arrows were anointed with poison. They also rubbed and over to color and whitewash and to paint. This is where we get the word paint is connected with being anointed. Why? Because they rubbed, they, they smeared a substance over a, over a surface. For example, red coloured goat skins, ointment. These are all ancient Greek things they did every day as well as in the Bible. From Creo, we get the word Christos. 
Christ is exactly the same as Messiah. Messiah is directly transliterated from the Greek, uh, from the Hebrew, sorry. Christ, Christos, is Greek. And it's the exact same terminology as the Messiah. And the Messiah means the anointed one. And it's a noun. Whereas creo is the verb. It's the smearing of the oil. It's the smearing of whatever substance you're smearing on. Whereas the Messiah or Christos is the, is the noun. It's the person. It's the anointed one or the anointed thing. Like when they anointed the temple or the tabernacle. That was an anointed one. What's a tabernacle? It's a noun. It's a place. It's a thing. So Christos or Messiah is the, the noun of the thing being anointed. So let's go over to the Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word is Meshach. Meshach. And it means to smear, anoint, ointment, paint. So we see all the similar Meanings in the Hebrew word also means as consecration, setting apart for the office or an office. Ointments were made from oils and smeared on injuries for healing. Oil was used on the heads of individuals who are being given the office of a prophet, priest or king as a sign of authority. So the word for Christos in Hebrew is Mashiach. This is why you might hear people pray when they pray, they say Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Anointed One. Mashiach is the anointed, the anointed one, it's the noun, one who is smeared with oil as a sign of authority. It must be said that oil is also symbolic of the spirit of Yahweh for a believer. <laughs> So the Holy Spirit is directly connected to the anointing in a believer's life. Yeshua, or Jesus, is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Mashiach. The origin of both these words means to separate out. This is what happens when one is anointed. For example, when Saul was anointed, he was a Mashiach. When David was anointed, he was a Mashiach. Notice how I'm saying a Mashiach, not the Mashiach. As we know, Yeshua is the Mashiach. But all the kings of Israel, all the, uh, the high priests, they were anointed. They were Mashiachs. They were set apart. They were separated out from among their brethren. That's what the anointing, the act of anointing is what separated them. What gave them that authority and that that offers to rule over others. This is where we get the idea of being separated out. Again, in ancient cultures among the Hittites, one of the rites at the king's enthronement was his anointing. The anointing is what separated him out, what gave him that authority. It gave him the ability or authority to rule. There is no reference to the anointing of the king in Egypt. However, he himself anoints high officials into their office. In the Old Testament, there is a distinction between the rubbing or smearing, anointing of oneself for health and physical well-being, than the smearing and pouring of an anointing as a legal action. There's a difference, obviously, because people anoint themselves every day. You know, it was part of refreshing and reviving their bodies. But in the Bible, when we're talking about anointing kings and prophets and priests and all these different characters, it's to set them apart into an office. It's a legal term. It's a legal action. For example, the anointing of a king, of the high priest, which was done with pouring oil over the head. The purpose of anointing one legally is to give them power, strength, and authority. Remember I said before, oil is directly connected with the Holy Spirit. So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we have an anointing, which is not our power, it's not our authority, it's not our strength, 
It's his. This is why when you see Yeshua didn't do anything until he was baptised and the Spirit of God descended upon him. And then he went and did stuff. Antichrist. So we've just gone through the terminology of Christ. So now we can go into Antichrist. Antichrist is translated from a combination of two Greek words. Anti and Christos. Anti means not only anti in the sense of against or opposite of, but also in place of. Now this is key. Anti also means in place of, in Greek meanings. Anti is a preposition. What's a preposition? Over, against, beneath, under, to the side. These are all prepositions. Anti in our culture, so this is the thing, we view these things from our our English mindset. Anti in our culture means something that opposes or is opposite of. But the word biblically is used differently as in the sense instead of or because of. The instead of or because of. Let's look in Hebrew. The Hebrew word for anti is tahat. Tahat. It's also a preposition meaning under, below or instead of. So the word tahat in Hebrew is equivalent to the word anti, or one of the Hebrew words that is equivalent to the Greek anti. Tahat means under, below, or instead of. The other meaning under is used also in the sense to be underneath, in the sense of being in place of something else. This can be described in the sense of an understudy. What's an understudy? An understudy is one who knows the part, how to play a role if the lead actor needs to be replaced for whatever reason. It is a person who knows and looks the part of the lead. In this example, we see the idea of not so much opposing but mimicking instead of. Someone or something setting themselves or itself up to be like the Messiah. The instead of. Not so much opposing or against the instead of Messiah. This is what these prepositions means. So in Hebrew, the phrase Antichrist is Mashiach Tahat. The Mashiach Tahat. That's how you would say Antichrist in Hebrew. The instead of Messiah. One that knows the part, knows the words, knows the lingo, knows how to act, knows how to do all the stuff, but is the instead of, the understudy. The Antichrist will be an anointed one. All right? The Antichrist will be an anointed one, one that is put into an office by the people, not Yahweh. We know in biblical terms they were always put into the office by the authority of Yahweh. Yes, Yahweh used men and men to anoint them, but it was on his command. Anoint this person, anoint that person. What's an example? Remember Samuel the prophet was told to go to the house of Jesse. And he was to anoint one of the sons. And he looked at all the sons and none of them were that one. And then he actually said to Jesse, the father, do you have another son? And he said, yes, I do. He's out in the field. Go and get him. And he was the youngest of the seven. So it's not so much being the eldest or the firstborn. It's the one God chooses. So they went and got David, who was the youngest, small, ruddy one. And Yahweh said to Samuel, that's him. And he anointed him with oil. So the Antichrist will be an anointed one. One that is put into an office by the people. Not Yahweh. But not the office, as that is Messiah Yeshua. 
So now we're going to work our way through the scriptures. We're going to go through the first two occurrences of this word Antichrist, which is in the same passage. 1 John 2 verses 18 to 23. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even how many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing (laughs) of the Holy One, and you know all things. Why? Because if you are anointed by the Holy One, you're filled with the Holy Spirit that will teach you all truth and guide you into all truth. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he who denies that Yeshua is the Mashiach, he is the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. This is why context is so important. In this passage we have two occurrences, one of which is the Antichrist, singular, the Antichrist, and the other Antichrist, which is plural. So these two are obviously different. One was there, one was there are many Antichrists, plural, among you. So these Antichrists were among the congregations, were among the assembly. They weren't outside, they weren't the pagans, they were among the believers, they were part of the believers. They were among them. And the other Antichrist was still to come, which is the Antichrist. And then in verse 22, it goes on to say that whoever denies that Yeshua is the Messiah and the Father is Antichrist. Not the Antichrist. Anyone that denies the Father and the, and the Son is Antichrist, not the Antichrist. It says, is Antichrist. These were all part of the assembly. I mean, this just amazes me. Because it says earlier that they went out from among them. They were part of the Mishpaka. They were part of the believers. And they got upset and they took off. And that's when they were manifested as being as Antichrist. They were of them. They were among them. They were their brothers and sisters. They kept the feast with them. They broke bread with them. And they were called Antichrist. This is the context. Remember, John, the letter, these little letters of John are written to believers. They're not written to the people running the, uh, the, the pagan temples. They're written to the believers. Saying that they were of them. And then they went out from among them and not of them any longer. There's much more to be said about that, but that's another time. Let's go on to another occurrence in John 1, uh, 1 John 4 verses 1 to 4. Beloved, again, believers, he's talking about believers, he's talking to the believers. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua HaMashiach has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Yeshua HaMashiach has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. The Antichrist. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming, future tense, and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What's the context? Antichrist. So a couple of things in this passage. 
They had heard of Antichrist coming. This is 2,000 years ago. They had heard Antichrist coming is already in the world 2,000 years ago. I propose that Antichrist has been since that archangel said, I want to be God. I want to have dominion. I want to rule. I want to be the instead of. Right from the beginning. And then manifested as the serpent in the garden that deceived Adam and Eve. And this is the exciting part for us as believers. First, Verse 4 says, and declares that we overcome them because greater is he that is in us, the real deal, than he that is in the world, the instead of. For more on who we are in Messiah Yeshua in regards to Satan, I encourage you to watch the teaching series on Satan, the adversary. So that's the exciting part is that he who is in us, Who's that? Yeshua, the Holy Spirit. Because he's in us, we're greater than he that's in the world. Who is in the world? Antichrist. The instead of. That's what my Bible says. And the last occurrence in 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Yeshua as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Again, it's not the antichrist and an antichrist. So whoever believes and says that Yeshua didn't come is an antichrist. Again, we see these antichrists were around and are in the world. Anyone that does not confess Messiah Yeshua as coming in the flesh is antichrist. Let's put that in today's context and see how we go. Wow, there's a lot of people that say that Yeshua was just a prophet. He was a good man. Wow, they are Antichrist. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith. So this is lining up with what we just read in 1 John. They went out from among them. They were of us, but they're of us no more. That in the latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons are antichrist, obviously. These are people being influenced by Satan, those that teach and preach that the commandments are done away with is an antichrist. They are lawless. That teach that the seventh day is not the Sabbath is antichrist. They are lawless. I could go on and on with this. If we bring what the Bible says into today's context, the majority of people that confess that Yeshua is the Messiah are antichrist. Because they're doing against, the, they're opposing, they're, they're instead of. We have Sunday instead of Saturday. We have Christmas instead of Sukkot. We have Easter instead of Passover. You see the instead ofs taking place. They have their own times and seasons. We eat pork instead of lamb. We could go on and on and on. Their message is not the ways of Yahweh. Put all this in, in the context of today's preaching and teaching among the believers. The above verses can be related to other verses that imply the same characteristics of the Antichrist. For example, Matthew 24 verse 5. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Mashiach and will deceive many. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Mashiach and will deceive many. This has already happened. This has happened throughout history. It happens today. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
Matthew 13, 21 and 22. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Mashiach, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christ or Mashiachs or Messiahs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. It does not say in these verses that we just read out, it does not say that the elect will be deceived. It says, if possible. It does not say that they will be deceived. It says, if possible, they will be. Even the elect, and we see that in 1 John, where they mentioned Antichrist, plural, were among them already. They came out from, from them. Remember the parables of the tares and the wheats. They were together. They were in the same ground. They were in the same field. They were in the same assembly or the same fellowships. They were together and then one was removed from the other. This is a big one. This passage of scripture is probably the most known passage to do with the Antichrist. Now these passages don't talk about the Antichrist. It is implied that they are connected. So let's look at this, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had, had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called of God or that is worshipped. So these are key things. These are key words. He exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits on God uh, sorry, <laughs> so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2, uh, two eight to 12 And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this is all to do with those that reject the Messiah. But what blew my mind is, let's look at verse 11. Sorry, let's go back to verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, the unbelievers, the ones that don't want to know anything about Yah, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send strong delusion. I mean, what? God's going to send a delusion, not the Antichrist. God will send strong delusion that they should believe the lie. I thought, my goodness, Yahweh's going to send a delusion. Not the false prophets, not the false Christ, not the false teachers. Yahweh's going to send a strong delusion. Why? Because their hearts are already hard. They don't want to know. They have pleasure in their unrighteousness. They love their lives of sin. They don't want to follow Yahweh. So therefore... God will send them strong delusion. That's what it says. That they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure. That means they don't want to change. They want to live the way they want to live. Pleasure in unrighteousness. But if we look back in verse 8, it says, And then the lawless one will be revealed. The word revealed in this passage uses the Greek word apocalypto, 
The word revealed in that passage that we just read out is the word apocalypto, and it means to uncover, lay open what has been veiled or covered up, to disclose, make bare. Metaphorically, it means to make known, make manifest, disclose what before was unknown. This is the same root word in our English word apocalypse, which is the word behind the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation means something that has been uh, veiled and closed up. It's going to be revealed. That's the real meaning behind the book of Revelation. So why am I bringing this out? Because this is in reference to the man of sin to the son of perdition, the lawless one, are believed by many as antichrist. There's no argument there. They're believed by many. This this man of sin, this son of perdition, this lawless one, are believed by many as the antichrist. We know from verses earlier that they were already at work in the world. But the point I want to make very clear is that the antichrist linked with all the other titles that we just mentioned, the son of perdition, the lawless one, the man of sin, are all titles just mentioned, will be revealed. They haven't been revealed yet. The Antichrist has not been revealed yet. It says that Yahweh will reveal them, will make what has been veiled, what has been covered, he will make them known. I don't believe that's happened yet as far as the Antichrist. Those of us who are filled with and led by the Spirit of Yahweh will definitely see this coming. Why? Because Yeshua, Paul and John were teaching them and is teaching us what to look for. That's what Thessalonians is all about. This is what Yeshua said in Matthew and Mark is all about teaching us what to look for. Paul and John and Yeshua are teaching them what to look for, and when it is revealed by Yahweh, they will know, or we will know. It hasn't been revealed yet. I haven't heard of anyone doing the signs and wonders talked about what we just read. I haven't heard anyone doing that, doing the signs and wonders talked about. One that is acting, I haven't seen this either. And I don't think anyone else has. They haven't seen anyone acting and behaving as the instead of Messiah. Because they'll tell you what, when that happens, the whole world's going to know about it. Can you imagine somebody or something walking around doing what Yeshua did in the first century? Healing the cripples, raising the dead. You know, healing these incurable diseases. That is not going to be held quiet. But yet this is what this, this, this Antichrist will do. So I haven't seen one behaving as the instead of Messiah. There have no doubt been many that have proclaimed and been proclaimed as Messiahs, but no one that has done the signs and wonders. For example, Simon Bar Kokhba was the Jewish military leader who was proclaimed by one of the Jewish people's most famous rabbi, Rabbi Akiva. He, this, this military leader was proclaimed as the Messiah which was obviously false. This is one of the main reasons Jewish people reject Messianic Jews, because of that one thing. Because they rejected the Messianic believers at the time, rejected Simon Bar Kokhba as being the Messiah, because in their eyes the Messiah had already come. In the person of Yeshua HaMashiach. Nearly there. Isaiah 5. 20 to 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to to those who are wise in their own eyes, my goodness, and prudent in their own sight. This is linked to perverse doctrines, false teachers, and behaving as antichrist. I'm wise, I know what's going on. I don't need anyone to tell me what to do. I'm prudent. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. 
As we know, there are many around calling evil good and good evil. I mean, we're, 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 we're living this in our own societies today. They're putting darkness for light and light for darkness. They're putting bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Matthew 10, 32 to 33, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. That's just another way of saying whoever says that I'm not the Messiah, I will deny him before my Father. There will be many antichrists in the world in the end times. We read this in scriptures earlier. There will be many antichrists in the world in the end times. There are here now. There's a lot of antichrist teaching going around. Yeshua said the end times will be like it was in the days of Noah and Lot. There will, they, in the days of Noah and Lot, they were all antichrist or anti-God. Back then, they were all against God because Noah and his family were the only righteous ones. So Yeshua says, as it was in the days of Noah and Lot, so it will be. And we know back then they were all anti-God, they were all against God. It's happening again today. After all is said and done, maybe the issue should not be really about the who or what is the Antichrist, as we know this, that there is nothing one can do about it. If you know who it is or what it is, there's nothing you can do about it. It's Yahweh's will, it's Yahweh's plan, it's going to come. It is Yahweh's will, it's Yahweh's purpose that this will someday happen. He knows when the Antichrist will be revealed. Why? Because he will reveal it. We read this in 2 Thessalonians. It's it's disclosed, it's, it's, it's veiled, it's covered at the moment. He's going to make it known. Maybe the issue should really be about you and your walk with Yahweh. As it seems to me in the scriptures that mention the Antichrist, or Antichrist plural, they are warning of how not to get caught up into the teachings of these false lying spirits. The letters of John are warning us not to get caught up with all the hoo-ha, with all the doctrines, with all the this, it's, it's this, it's that, it's, it's that organisation, it's them. Yeshua and Paul also teach us what to look for and that it will be revealed in his time and not ours. One's main concern and issue should be, are you following and walking in the ways of Yahweh? Do you confess that Messiah has come in the flesh and is the Son of God. And not only that, we have the authority over the Antichrist. We just read that. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We have authority over the Antichrist in Messiah. For as we read earlier, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That was in the context of Antichrist. That was the passage we read out. It wasn't in another context. The one we should be looking for and concerning ourselves is him, Yeshua. Let's finish on this. 2 Peter 3, 15 to 18. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Also, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught, unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do with the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Yeshua HaMashiach. To him be the glory both forever and ever. Amen.
I'm telling you, there is a lot of unstable people out there. There are a lot of people out there that are untaught. And they have many of their own doctrines and opinions and philosophies that go with it. We are told not to listen to such things. We've been warned beforehand. Yeshua told us, beware of false prophets and false Christ. Paul told us what they're going to be behaving like. Oh, you don't need to keep the Sabbath. Oh, you can eat whatever you want. Oh, you, Christmas is okay. We're doing it in his name. In another passage it says many will come in his name. Oh dear. We have been taught what to look for. We have been warned what not to follow and get caught up in the doctrines of men and the things of this world. By one who proclaims to be Christ or say here he is or there he is, even when they do mighty things. Even when they do mighty things, even if they prophesy and what they say comes to pass, we're still not to, we're, we're to test every spirit. For Messiah Yeshua said he will return the way he left in the clouds. So if somebody comes back and is proclaimed to be the Messiah, my first question will be, did he come back on the clouds? So we're not to be entangled by the foolish issues of this world but to preach the gospel and to make disciples. This is what Yeshua, one of the last things he said to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. He did not say to get caught up in all the rubbish that the world wants to get caught up in. As we have seen, many have been accused of being the Antichrist in the past and many today are accused with the same accusation. Let us not get tied up in all of that. I don't believe we are called to call out the Antichrist. We're not called to call it out. Because Yahweh will make him known, or it known. And believe me, we will know when it is, or we will know when he is, or it is revealed. We know what to look for. We know what to look for. We need to guard and protect against false doctrines and teachings for there are many out there and they are mostly from men and women who want to be renowned themselves. They want a name for themselves. They want to have a 100,000 people liking them and watching them and following them. This is where all this rubbish comes from. Is from men and women who want renown for themselves. They have a lust and agreed for power and fame. They don't give two hoots about your relationship with Yahweh and how to teach you how to draw closer to Him. They just want to, they just want to be known themselves. They do not follow the way which Yahweh has set forth in His Word. They are lawless. Without the Torah of Yahweh. We are called to be set apart from all this. We are called to be set apart from all that and be his representatives. Who are we supposed to be his representatives here on earth and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you? That's what we're called to do, to give an account and a defense for when someone says to you, why aren't you freaking out? Why aren't you worried about what's going on in the world? Because I have a hope that's in me. I have a, I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I have a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. This is what we're called to do. We're not called to worry about who is or who isn't or what is or what isn't the Antichrist. Like we said earlier, that's Yahweh's domain. He will make that person or that entity or that organization or whatever it is he will reveal it when he's good and ready he will make it known we don't have to worry about it and when it is made known and when it is revealed we will know exactly what's going on but i tell you what it will be someone that will be like messiah the instead of 
There will be someone that's been anointed by the people. There will be someone that's been set apart for the office. Because that's what a Mashiach is. A Mashiach is someone that's set apart and anointed for an office. But not the office, because that office is already taken by Yeshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I just pray that whoever listens to this message, Father, that they would open their hearts, that they would be ministered to by your word, and your word is truth. Father, help us to keep our eyes on Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Anointed One, Yeshua the Messiah. And Father, help each and every one of us to be representatives of you and your kingdom on this earth. Father, to be a light unto the nations, to be a light among people who are living in darkness. Father, to be good in times of evil. And Father, to be sweet when there's so much bitterness and hatred around. Father, help us to be your people. Help us to to fulfill what you said. Go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Father, help us not to get caught up in all the entrapments, in all the doctrines, in all the philosophies, in all the accusations. Father, that's bordering on Lashon Harah. Father, help us to keep away from that and help us to maintain who we are supposed to be and that are, that is your children, children of the Most High God. Father, help us in this day and hour. Remind us by your Spirit that we are called to be sons and daughters of light. Father, help us to give a defence to everyone who asks us for the hope that's within us. Father, that's all that matters. Father, we thank you that uh, your word is truth. Your scriptures don't lie. Father, we bless you and we praise you. Father, may we be a people that have a sound mind. People of power. Not of our our own power, but your power. Your Holy Spirit. And the people of love. We bless you and we thank you for all that you've done for us and that continue to do for us. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.